Wow. Hi, this is Michael Simpkin. I am here for this month's What's Up With Us of the Real Property Law section of the California Lawyers Association. Um, Neil Kalin um, is busy today, so I'm going to be doing this all by myself with some help from our guest um, interviewee, Pam Enslin. Hi, Pam. I, can, I was going to say good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> So we have some interesting cases today, um, and we'll go over those for a bit. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in, in the chat, and I'll, I'll try to read them, or someone will nudge me to read them. If someone wants a copy of the PowerPoint, you can email me, and I'm, I'll be perfectly happy to send you a copy of it. If you want to email me, uh, my email is michael at simpkinlaw.com. M-I-C-H-A-E-L at S-I-M-K-I-N-L-A-W dot com. All right. So what we're going to do is get started here. With me sharing the screen, but we're going to share this part. So I did the introduction, and these are going to be some of the cases that we're going to talk about today. It's still summer, so I'm not, it's hot here. I'm not going to be wearing my suit or a tie, even though it's pretty rare for me to wear that unless I'm in court. But we have a couple cases today of interest. We have DUA versus Stillwater Insurance. It's a pretty traditional insurance coverage analysis case, and it's, it's about a dog bite. Okay, those come up a lot. We're going to talk about that. And it's interesting how the court said that there's a duty to defend, even if it's not likely that there's going to be the actual identification. Another case is a uh, cannabis case. I know that we have a lot of people that are practicing cannabis laws. I've evicted several cannabis operations. And this one was also about an eviction. But I did learn something um, as a fun case. We have Pam that we're going to interview. And then we have my favorite case, I think, of the year. It's called Southwest Terminal versus Astor Land. It's a case from Saskatchewan, Canada. And, and I learned about this case because, as some of you know, I am now an attorney also admitted to Ontario, Canada. And this is about how an emoji can express a contractual agreement between parties. And as I was doing my homework for this case, I even found another case from Israel where they did the same thing about emojis showing consent to an agreement. And then we have another case here, um, Diane Lee versus David Cardiff. This is about a swimming pool contractor. And if attorney's fees can be awarded under a civil code section and the business and professional code section that specifically deals with swimming pool contractor negligence or defects and what the court said about that and then we're going to talk about you know some of our upcoming events oh, oops oh, maybe i should do it this way so like i said today is summer and while i'm not sure about the spelling i saw that this guy is offering a subpoena colada <laughs> i don't pam that that's not spelled right is it i'm okay. not sure <laughs> but if you have enough of them, doesn't really matter. <laughs> so our first case, Dua versus Stillwater. And if you guys ask for um, the PowerPoint, I have the link to the cases in the PowerPoint. So in this case, the homeowner's insurer refused to defend the homeowner after her boyfriend's pit bulls bit third parties on the public street. So that's kind of interesting. There's some insurance issues right there. Um, this insurance policy had several exclusions for um, animal bites, which is not good because I recently had a case as a plaintiff um, where we got some money from someone's homeowner insurance for biting someone. Um, 
there was an ambiguity in the contract. This, I think, happens more often than people think, where the policy, when it got sent to the insured, like I said, there were three exclusions. And on the last exclusion, it said something about C page three, and there was no page three. It was just missing physically, which, of course, is a travel issue of fact, I guess, but that was something that helped out here. This policy also said very specifically that it will provide, provide a defense even if the underlying action is frivolous, groundless, false, or fraudulent. And that was helpful for the insured. So at the time of the, in the trial court, the trial judge entered summary judgment in favor of the insurer. But luckily, it was reversed by the appellate court. And this case had, like I said, a very nice traditional insurance coverage analysis. And they found maybe it's a frivolous claim. Maybe it's claim there's no liability. Maybe there's not going to be a duty to indemnify. But as far as the duty to defend, that is much broader. And a couple of the issues, like I mentioned, missing that third exclusion for animal bites because someone in the office was sloppy when they sent the policy over makes a big difference. So they reversed the summary judgment for the insurer. Um, ultimately, I saw that the case was settled. But I want to take a moment to talk with about insurance coverage. Something that I'm amazed about is how often attorneys, real property litigation attorneys, forget to tender cases to their insurer. Um, when I was a brand new lawyer, I worked in insurance defense and, and insurance defense coverage. It's crazy why people don't tender matters to the insurer. Um, I just tendered something as a defamation case. And luckily, the guy had an umbrella policy, 100% coverage for defamation under the homeowner's umbrella policy. Very important to do that. Very important to tender it early on in the case. Because once you tender it, then any attorney's fees incurred after that um, might be reimbursed so long as they pick up the defense. So it's critical for everyone to remember to tender it. Um, very important. The other part that comes up with insurance coverage with real property cases I see is the insurance companies try to wiggle out of coverage. They wanna take your premium, but they don't wanna pay anything. And they claim, well, that's not bought property damage. That's not bodily injury. Um, this comes up, say, in encroachment cases. It comes up often in easement cases. And there are cases that allow them not to cover it in easement or encroachment cases because it's not property damage. Um, even if you argue, well, they screwed something into my wall. Nah, it's not going to work. Okay. But very important to go over this and try to find coverage. Um, the court did a nice analysis. They went through everything in this um, Dua versus Stillwater case, um, you know, reiterating how any exclusions about like the pet, no pet, no animal bites are, are covered, have to be narrowly construed. The exclusionary clause must be conspicuous, plain and clear. A lot of cases about that. Um, I think there's wiggle room both directions on that issue but something else to look at. The other thing that comes up about when you tender the defense, this case talked about how facts extrinsic to the complaint can give rise to a duty to defend when they reveal a possibility that the claim may be covered by the policy. What this means is you have a complaint and say it's a really bare bones complaint. And so under the bare bones complaint, the insurer is saying, well, they don't really allege property damages or they don't allege whatever. And then you're going to say, but there is coverage because the plaintiff's lawyer sent a letter and in the demand letter, they listed all these things that were broken. They said during the time of construction, they had a bulldozer to do the pool and it hit my wall and it broke an eight foot section of my wall. OK, um, or whatever it is. Now you take that demand letter and you send it to your insurer and they can put it together and say, oh, 
okay, so maybe there is some coverage because after he did that, then people got out of got out of the home and they started fighting with each other. I don't know, whatever it is. Conversely, extrinsic facts, you have to be careful. That could eliminate the potential for coverage. I can see that happening really easily. Remember, words fly, paper sticks. Um, you got to be careful what you guys commit to writing. It might help or hurt you. Um, so anyway, after the court evaluated what happened and, and, the, and looked at the pleading itself, the appellate court said there's a possibility of coverage, especially when that exclusion page was missing. Um, so I thought that was a good case. Pam, when you were an attorney in Michigan, did you do any insurance coverage work? You know, I did very little. I I was a trial lawyer, but I was primarily um, representing colleges and universities. And when I represented corporations, uh, it was not in the area of real property and it wasn't generally insurance defense. Every once in a while, there was a case either with the university or with a company I represented where there was coverage that that would happen sometimes where there were employment cases and they had some a little bit of coverage for that. And I always, you know, as you said earlier, I sort of lived in fear of the day I forgot to tell my client they need to call their carrier. So I, I appreciate that advice. Yeah. So now we get to a, another fun case. This is a cannabis case. Uh, 65, 282, two bunch palms. And in this case, um, someone rented an industrial building in Desert Hot Springs to grow cannabis. And the parties apparently spoke about the terms of the lease, but they never came to a written agreement. They were talking about it and talking about it. And the landlord said, it's okay, you can start and we're going to work this out. Um, the, the appellate decision doesn't get into great details about those facts. But after the first year passed, it was, we still don't have a written lease. And the landlord apparently got upset and issued a 30-day notice to quit. Um, the landlord filed an eviction and won $180,000 in damages. Um, that would have been holdover damages. So I learned something here that I, I didn't think about, even though I kind of know about it. Um, the tenant argued it could not be evicted under a presumption of civil code 1943, creating a one-year tenancy for agricultural purposes. Okay, And then there's another presumption of a one-year holdover tenancy for agricultural lands under the eviction code sections. And, and the eviction code section 11612 is the normal code section that you would use, say, for non-payment of rent. But if you read it, there's a, a whole line about agricultural purposes. And so the policy here is, you know, farmers. Farmers have a lot invested. Farmers can't pull up their crops and just move them. Um, if they had to do that, they would destroy the crops. They have a big investment. And if the landlord is like, you know, waits too long, then you let them have another one year to clear out their crops, basically. So that was a tenant's defense, which at first blush sounds kind of reasonable and guys growing cannabis. Um, but this is what's interesting about it. When you read in the case, they say that the appellate court looked at this and the, so did, as the trial court did, and they said, well, are you a farmer? Is cannabis farming? Yeah, I think it is, it's farming. But then they started to like look at things like the dictionary and the other things. And they go, well, how do you grow cannabis? You grow cannabis in these pots and they're fed with water, drip irrigation, whatever. And you also move these pots around and you do something and it's indoors. This isn't a field outside. So the trial court and the appellate court said, I don't think you get the benefit of this agricultural presumption of these two code sections because you're not a real farmer. You're growing weed, 
but the weed is in a pot that you pick up and you move around and it's indoors. You're not tilling the soil. This is not the traditional farmer. So they said that that presumption under 1943 does not apply. And the simplest answer here is that that section 1161 paragraph two, that's for non-payment of rent. And guess what? The landlord attorney in this case is really smart. He must have understood the law because he served a 30-day notice to quit. So 30 day notice to quit is no fault. It's if you have a month-to-month -month tenancy, end it, end of story. So the appellate court said, forget that 11612 about, oh yeah, we're a holdover, but we get an extra year to live here, to stay here and grow our weed. So they lost under both of those theories. Um, the appellate court also looking at the underlying facts said, you, you have an oral agreement and it's only month to month because the only evidence that was presented showed that the parties intended to have a written rental agreement, like without a doubt, that was their intention. And so they have this temporary oral month to month agreement. So under the um, contract analysis of what did they have, it was clear as month to month. So there's no presumption anyway. So under any way of looking at it, the landlord was going to win. So I think the landlord attorney did a great job. The tenant attorney kept fighting, um, but they should have left it alone. And I believe in this case, at the very end, after it was briefed and after a tentative ruling was issued by the appellate court, the cannabis growing attorney tried to get the court to dismiss the appeal. And there's some rules of um, practice where well, once the appellate court has gone through the work of reading up the case, working out, writing out an opinion, issuing the tentative, it's kind of like a summary judgment motion. Once there's a tentative out there, you can't dismiss your case. Same thing here. Once there's a tentative from the appellate court, they said, sorry, we're not going to let you dismiss the case. I think they wanted to save an award of costs, but nope, the cannabis score lost. But um, I really do like that case about, you know, tilling the ground and what is the cannabis grower? What do you think of that one, Pam? It's, it's interesting. I like that. Uh, I've, I've had a few of these cannabis cases. So they're, they're entertaining. <laughs> We had that I was in Michigan, and, and uh, as soon as marijuana was legalized in Michigan, several of my, I was in a big firm, and we created a marijuana division within our firm that were working on those sorts of issues. That's a big thing. And, and if um, the real property section has several attorneys that do a lot of work in the cannabis um, industry um, on the executive committee there are several lawyers that do that and if anybody has a cannabis type question um, if they reach out to me I can try to hook you up with an attorney that I know is practicing you know in the cannabis world so now we come to you <laughs> so Miss Pam Enslin is the executive director of the California Law Pathways and this is a nonprofit organization to help students um, but before we get to that, I wonder if you could tell us um, how did, why did you become a lawyer? I mean, was that your first choice or do you have anything else in mind? Uh, well, I, I grew up in Michigan. I actually um, went to the University of Michigan and I was a music major for, I have a, I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in oboe performance, believe it oboe? or not. Oboe? Yes. No way. <laughs> You know so, what I play? I play the oboe. Do you really? I, I sell my Loray oboe. Yeah. Um, Me too. <laughs> I haven't. That's funny. That. My, <laughs> my, read, my reads are older than my kids. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. I played um, actually all the way. I supported myself through law school playing and um, continued to play for a while after law school. And then. Um, when my husband and I had a son, I put it up in the closet and retired, retired the elbow. But yeah, so 
being a lawyer was not on the radar. I never met a lawyer. Um, and when I was in college, I would uh, sometimes get temporary jobs just doing office administrative type work. And I met a lawyer that way who was, uh, she was in the general counsel's office at Ford Motor Company. And she actually is the person who started talking to me about going to law school and and being a lawyer. So um, that's how I got there. Wow, I like that story. Um, I always wanted to be a lawyer, basically. I remember when I was in Boy Scouts getting a Boy Scout badge in law, and that my scout master, um, his name is Barry Hinden. He's a pretty well-known workers comp lawyer now, but at the time, I don't know, I guess he was probably like a brand new lawyer, like 27 years old, and he was a scout master. And I even babysat for his kid, I remember. And his kid now runs the law firm. It's just amazing. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, where so life leads you. No, I'm sorry. I said it's interesting where life leads you. Yeah. yeah. So, did you go to where did you go to law school? I went to law school at uh, Wayne State, which is in Detroit. Okay. And while I was there, I worked for the city of Detroit law department, which is probably the reason I actually graduated from law school because I, having been a music major um, and starting law school with no preparation whatsoever and no idea what it would take to be a lawyer, uh, the first year of law school was a, was a real shock to me. <laughs> and when I got that job in the city, um, they put me in the litigation department. I was working on police uh, misconduct cases, lawsuits. And it was, you know, the light bulb went on on what, why I was studying what I was studying and what it all meant and what, I, what it could be like to be a lawyer. And that was the moment I knew I was going to be a litigator. So how did you feel about defending police misconduct cases? You know, I... I at the time, I don't, I, I was just so happy to be with lawyers that were in court. My supervisor was a woman at that time, and she was actually the head of that division, which was very unusual at that time. And she had two other women lawyers working with her. And the, you know, the three of them kind of took me under their wings. And um, I didn't really think about you know, the issue of police misconduct, the way I think about it now, then I just was uh, thrilled to be in that job. And these people were so encouraging and so good to me. It's, you know, I've tried over the years to sort of pay it, pay it back, pay it forward by doing that for somebody else. It was, they were really extraordinary. I was very, very fortunate. Oh, so that was really important to your career development to have not just a mentor, but a woman like you to look after. And in a way, um, the work you do today, I want you to talk about that. And that's also another way to, you know, you're helping people find. Yeah, it's kind of a lot, you know, in some ways along the same path. Um, so as I said, I was, I was a litigator. I was actually a big firm lawyer in Michigan. I worked for the two largest firms. And then um, I decided about 18 months ago that I, my son is moving to Utah and I wasn't interested in moving to Utah, but I had years ago taken the California bar. And so uh, I decided I would think about moving to California and I learned about this job and um, I had been on, in both of my firms, I had been on the, the DEI, what's now called the DEI committee, then it was probably called the diversity committee. And I knew um, from that experience how difficult or, or the difficulties that we had in Michigan in bringing in diverse lawyers. And, you know, we were getting more and more women, but the women were not, uh, you know, the, the, by and large, not the managing partners, they were not the equity partners. And so there was a lot of disparity and a lot of work that needed to be done on diversifying um, those firms. And I was also doing 
work with the American Bar Association. I've been forever a member of the dispute resolution section. And I was asked to make a presentation at the House of Delegates on a resolution that had to do with um, supporting the use of diverse neutrals in dispute resolution. And, and in reading white papers and, and getting ready for that speech, I learned a lot about how truly lacking in diversity the legal profession is. And at that time, actually, ADR was the least diverse area of the already not very diverse legal profession. So both of those things, I think, along with my background, played into me thinking that this job, which is all about um, providing pathways and pipelines for um, law stu or students from high school through community college, if they go there, or undergrad and into law school, providing pathways for diverse students. And, and by diverse, you know, we're talking about income, we're talking about, you know, first generation, we're talking, uh, in some cases, undocumented, but we're talking about diversity in, in every conceivable way. Uh, and so this job and, and its mission, which is to make the legal profession and the justice system in California look like the population of California uh, seemed like um, something I could really embrace. And I was at a point in my career where I was felt like I had done enough of the um, litigation and, and practicing law in a firm and um, going into a nonprofit seemed like a good, a good plan for the next chapter. How so does that, your organization reach out to um, these you know, people to inspire them and help them get into the legal career? We have, um, there's a pathway. We have high schools that uh, have law academies. Some of them were the law academies. We have 23 of them right now. We're actually going to be adding another one soon. Um, and they're you know, throughout the state. Uh, the students in those law academies uh, make a self-determination in ninth grade or beginning of 10th grade. They want to get in the law academy and then they move together through ninth or excuse me, 10th, 11th and 12th grade. If they don't do that, uh, we have 30 right now and we're in the process of adding six more community colleges that have what we call our Cal Law Scholar programs. And those are, there's a specific seven course curriculum with two additional courses that we recommend. And the students who go through those curriculums, um, curriculi, whatever, um, they get certificates saying that they are Cal Law Scholars and then they can use those when they apply to, to undergrad to complete their undergrad and then to law school. So we have, um, right now we have the 23 high schools, 30 community colleges, we have uh, 16 undergrad schools and we have 14 of the 18 ABA accredited law schools in the state have all signed uh, an M or signed the same MOU with Cal Law. So they're all our official partners and they each agree to do different things. And we provide a lot of programming so that they communicate with each other and that we communicate with the students. We provide um, educational uh, sessions, webinars like this. Uh, we provide an annual two-day uh, summit meeting, which is always at one of our law schools. And that's that has um, educational and networking opportunities for not only our faculty, but our students. Uh, our law schools uh, provide if, if Cal Law Scholars apply to all 14 of our law schools or one of or two or however many, they don't have to pay the application fee. It's waived. Um, and so we're in constant contact with each of these entities. There are always what we call faculty champions who are there and they're the main representative of each of those institutions and they work with us on a, on a daily basis. Are these schools in Northern California or throughout the state? Throughout the state. We have, um, just looking at the law schools, we have UC Davis, which is where we're going to have our next summit. We have uh, McGeorge Law School, so those two in the Sacramento, Northern California. We have what used to be called Hastings, which is now the 
University of San Francisco Law School. I, I may not have that exactly right, but that's in um, San Francisco. We have uh, University of San Diego. We have USC. We have UCLA. We have um, UC Irvine. We have you know 14 of the 18 accredited. So they're all over the place. So wait, I have a question. At what point did the kids have to be in the Pathways program that ultimately after they graduate undergrad, they can get their application fees waived and go to UCLA? They have to be in it either through the high school academy or the community college program. And do they have to show that they participated in so many programs or how is yeah. that? Yeah, the the um, for high schools they have their uh, you know three years of classes and what happens with those students is they uh, for instance they all have a law class and they talk about just like you were doing earlier they give these summaries of cases they do mock trials most of our schools actually have built uh, a, a courtroom. Um, and they take these classes along with their regular high school classes. And to the extent possible, for instance, I was visiting one um, earlier that had for their biology class, instead of dissecting frogs and doing all of that stuff that we did when I took biology, they're, they're working with forensic evidence. They're working with fingerprints, blood typing, you know, things that, that tie in with the law. So they have to graduate. If they graduate, then they will get a certificate saying that they completed the um, Cal Law Academy program. People who start, and they can go then to one of our community colleges if they want. I have a question. So, so Pam, so the Cal Law program is part of the curricula of biology class or English class or, or something else? The topic of law is yes. Okay, and then I'm hesitating provide... because it's a law program, but it's part of our program. Yes. Okay. And then, do you provide the schools with materials, you know, to, to teach the the legal section of these classes? We provide um, volunteers. I'm actually working on getting some funding so that we can provide more, you know, textbooks and the you know real things like that. But right now, what we provide. Um, is primarily assistance support. We provide volunteers to go, you know, you go into uh, Jesse Bethel High School and talk about, you know, being a real property lawyer, or um, you decide, or another one of your section members decides to become a mentor to a high school student. And so you, you meet with that student four times a year, say, for an hour or two to just talk about, you know, a legal career and, and those sorts of issues. So if we, somebody wants, one of our viewers wants to um, volunteer to go to school and speak about criminal law, or real property law, or, or why they like to be a lawyer, they can contact you. Me. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. My, my email address I saw was in your materials. Please contact me. There are, you know, and there are other ways to volunteer. We have uh, what are called advisory councils for each of our high schools and community colleges. And those are local lawyers and judges who again meet quarterly or, you know, it's usually quarterly and talk about issues that relate to that particular school and how they can provide support. Okay. We also have some, you know, law firms or, um, public, you know, DA's office kind of things that um, provide internships, not not paid, but internships for students who can come in and, you know, shadow a, a lawyer. All organized and structured through California Law Pathways. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's possible some is, some are doing it without contacting us, but for the most part, that's our job is to, um, facilitate that kind of support. And if, people, and if people don't want to be a lawyer, but want to be a part of, like you said, that you could learn forensics, they want to be a policeman or FBI agent, would your program also support students looking into that type of a career? Yeah, absolutely. There, We have some, um, the first summit that I saw was actually before I started my job. And there was uh, one of our Cal Law students who had just become a police officer. Uh, there are some, and I would have to do research to to give 
specific numbers, but some of the academies, the high school academies are geared more toward uh, law enforcement careers. Some of the community colleges have programs that are geared more toward being a paralegal mm -hmm. or something in law enforcement. There are, you know, as you know, in a justice system, there are court reporters, court security, a lot of uh, bailiffs, a lot of other kinds of jobs that all make up part of that um, justice system. Yeah, and I see the importance because when I was young, like I said, I my Boy Scout leader happened to be a, a new lawyer, but a lot of people don't know lawyers. I, I interview people for secretary jobs all the time, and I ask, so why are you applying? Oh, I'm interested in the law. Do you have any lawyers in your family? Do you know anyone? No. And so the, especially I see, you know, for the, um, the you know, diversity right. people, that people that are first generation or whatever, they just don't know any lawyers. So this is a good opportunity. Both there's a structure and to meet someone. Right. Uh, right. So, so I, I see, and that that's what you do. Like how many doctors do you know whose father and uncle and cousin, they're all physicians. Right. You know, right. so it's like, you know, you, you want to follow like well, your parents. If, you're, if your parents do a certain type of work or have a habit and it's a good habit, you know, the kids want to emulate <laughs> their parents. So right. it's good to have yeah. these role models. Yeah. And when I, the, probably the first week when I started this job, which was a year ago, um, April, uh, I went to, I live in Benicia, which is um, the San Francisco Bay Area, and I went to a high school um, relatively close to me that has a, an academy, and I walked in, and as soon as the uh, female members of that class found out that I'm a lawyer, they were, you know, they'd never met a woman lawyer before, and uh, someone, you know, a person of color comes in there, and they've never met a person of color who's a lawyer. It's really, you know, I putting aside the, you know, the the mechanics of doing the job, being a volunteer is it's just fun because you're talking to students, they're all excited, you're talking about what you do and trying to help somebody figure out if that's what they want to do. Um, it's, you know, I would urge everybody to be a volunteer. It's just it's just fun and rewarding. Well, thank you. This is, uh, I think it's very inspiring what you do. And I th what we can do now is we can get back some specific legal stuff, inspire our existing lawyers to look at some new cases. <laughs> so, right, by the way, while you're doing that, I did some intense research while you were talking and subpoena Colada only has one L. That's what I thought. That's why I wasn't <laughs> going to take credit for that slide. <laughs> All right, let me move on. I'm clicking on my space bar. <laughs> Come on, I have to do this manually. There we go. This is the case of the day. Southwest Terminal versus Ashter. So this is a case about emojis. <laughs> um, I like emojis and I know I inappropriately use them all the time. And then there's other uses of emojis that are inappropriate that I've never even heard of. And I was looking on the internet about Google's uh, Googling this issue. And, you know, there's drug deals that have nothing but emojis in them. Did you know that? No. This is a complete drug dealers just use emojis. So maybe they're on to something because in Saskatchewan, the court found that emojis could give consent to a contract. So in Saskatchewan, which there's not a whole lot there other than agriculture, um, there are some people that for several years and regarding the sale of green grain, you know, wheat, flax, barley, whatever, um, they're doing it informally. They know each other. They're texting each other. I got, you know, 1,000 bushels of, you know, this type of wheat. And this, and I want, you know, five cents a, a pound or whatever it is. And they would exchange um, terms that might have phrases just simple, like looks good as a text or okay, or yep, or thumbs up, things like that. So at some point, 
someone thought they had a deal for the sale of flax. Actually, your hair is kind of like golden flax, right? <laughs> um, flaxen. So the trial court in Saskatchewan heard a case about the sale of $82,000 of flax where the consent was basically a thumbs up emoji and found that that's an agreement. So I guess over this deal, um, someone was unhappy and they appealed it. The appellate court went through this. It's kind of, it's kind of cute. Um, I, I can send you guys the link. Um, if you get the PowerPoint, you know, it's, it's right in there. But the appellate court said, well, emojis is a way of communication. And what's important is, is for the show consent is the parties knew what they were talking about. And by sending messages in the past, looks good, okay, or thumbs up emoji, things like that, they were able to communicate. And that the thumbs up emoji on this particular end of the conversation of text messages was clearly showing consent to the deal. And so they upheld the $82,000 obligation. Um, I've seen this before in other opinions. The court went to dictionary.com and they talked about the thumbs up emoji that's uh, accepted as approval. Um, but more importantly, the court said this wasn't a one off transaction with the thumbs up, that the parties had done other transactions before and they also use informal, like, okay, looks good, um, or thumbs up to indicate their assent to the contract. Um, while I was researching this case about emojis, I found another case that was in Israel and it was similar. So this is something that I think is going to be more and more prevalent. Um, I mean, do you agree with that court's decision, Pam? I don't know. I never thought about it. I certainly have used the thumbs up myself when I'm agreeing to something. So it, it as I read this, it sounds like they in part based it on the fact that the way these people communicated was pretty informal anyway. So yeah, probably. Well, they're farmers. They're not lawyers. They're not going to write out, you know, the whole pair, you know, the terms. They're like, dude, you know, I got this stuff here. Do you want it? <laughs> but I do wonder how far this will go. Um, I could see defamation cases about, you know, eggplant, oh, yeah. and other things. But yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting case. It is, you know, I have to, having a son, I had to use, learn how to use emojis and all that stuff if I want to communicate with him. You know, there are other things on the iPhone, you can, you can do like the balloons fill the screen, yeah. fireworks, what does that mean? Like blowing stuff up. I mean, I, I don't know, it could, something that's going to develop. So the final case for today um, is a case about a swimming pool contractor Northern California, Contra Costa County. When I saw this case, and there is about a $231,000 agreement to build a pool and an outdoor kitchen. My head was thinking Danville and Blackhawk. <laughs> That's what I think. But they, they did a pretty good job to spend almost a quarter million dollars on the backyard. But someone was not happy. So when the homeowner hired a pool contractor to redo her backyard, it apparently didn't turn out as planned. Looks like they, they had their disagreement and the contractor left the job. And then the homeowner, it looks like they had to rip out a lot of stuff and, and redo it. And it was substantially expensive. Um, the, the trial court found, for example, that the pool contractor unknowingly used unlicensed contractors. Um, that's one issue that we can talk about. And that there are several defects and a lot of work that had to be redone. There's a bunch of laws about contractors, use unlicensed contractors, maybe don't have workers' comp insurance. Um, you might have what's called disgorgement or have to give up all the money that you earned. It's a big issue. Um, although there is a statute of limitations that applies. So this pool contractor was ordered to disgorge the money he, that he had received. 
plus interest, and it to be more than the contract price. And then the property owner had damages for the repairs she had to make. That was like another $236,000. Now, what's the issue in this case is about attorney's fees. So apparently there was no attorney fee clause. The, the plaintiff, I think the plaintiff went overboard. They even sued the pool contract for elder abuse. I see a lot of that. You can't take a contract and just make elder abuse because the, the person is, you know, 65 or whatever, or 62. But they, the trial court awarded the property owner, you know, substantial damages, but found that the pool issue was fairly minor and it had to do with plaster and tile and coping. And although $35,000 sounds like a lot for that, maybe this pool is um, kind of like at Hearst Castle, something like that. I don't know. But they rejected the elder abuse claims, rejected the attorney fee provision. The trial court felt that there was sufficient punishment by the disgorgement and the pool issues were pretty small. So civil code 1029.8 and the business and professions code 7168.2 that talk about pool contractors and attorney's fees didn't feel that that should apply. Um, the property owner was upset. I saw in the opinion that her husband had also died like during this case but she kept fighting. Um, the appellate court affirmed the decision. They said that the court of appeal, the, the court of appeal said the trial court was correct in denying the attorney's fees under Code of Civil Procedure 1029.8 and Business and Professions Code 7168.2. Um, I like history. Besides being an oboe player, I was a history major in college. And they went through over 50 years of the statute's history about this. And what happened is the, starting like in the late 60s, the legislature was concerned about unscrupulous pool contractors, ripping people off, doing poor jobs. And so they tried to find ways to build in a process where the property owner would be made whole, including an award of attorney's fees. And they went through all of this and they said, you know, when you look at the language, the attorney general's report, everything in the history of it, it was clearly designed to help people who had a problem with a swimming pool. And they agreed to the trial court that the majority of the problems is not with the pool, but with the spa and the outdoor kitchen and paving and landscaping and these other things. So they said that even though it's a pool contractor and he was doing a lot more than building a pool, that the fee shifting statutes do not apply and so no attorney fees were awarded to the um, plaintiff and the pool contractor got his cost too do you think that was the right decision pam so the the contractor didn't challenge the rest of the court trial court's rulings no i i didn't see that um i, I don't recall him challenging the rest of it which is a substantial. I hope he had insurance that would yeah, it is pay half a million dollars of damages, but he, he, I just, in my mind, I'm trying to figure out what a 200 or, you know, a quarter of a million dollar backyard looks like. That's a lot of money. It's a people. lot, but the only issue was the attorney fees. Actually, I, I see that I wrote it. I remember the only issue on appeal was the attorney's fees. The yeah. full yeah. contractor did not challenge the underlying award. Interesting. They did talk about, I remember about how the pool contractor unknowingly used these unlicensed contractors and they don't, they didn't get into the, the specific facts, but yeah, they, they, they didn't want to punish the pool contract too much, but I mean, that's like half a million dollars of yeah. stuff. That's a lot. I mean, that's, that's the whole house built, rebuild the whole house, but I'm guessing it's a big house. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would I would imagine. Wow. This is California. It's not Michigan. Michigan. I know. I imagine a half a million dollar house. I know. <laughs> That's exactly it. I still haven't just quite acclimated to California. I've seen 
Interesting. pictures of houses for sale like today in Michigan, which it's a castle. It's in the forest and they're castle. literally a castle. Absolutely. Castle, yeah. <laughs> and it's less than $231,500. Yeah, that's not true everywhere. I mean, you know, there are very expensive, expensive houses in Michigan, but it's definitely not California. Did you keep your house in Michigan? Uh, I kept a uh, condo. My mother is still in Michigan. And she's not very well, so I I travel back there to to see her fairly frequently, and I still stay in the condo. I think she's in hospice now. I think when um, she passes away, I probably will sell that condo. But right now, I haven't yet. And I go back, and it's you know it's rainy and it's cloudy, and I think yeah, so you got the summer and the fall. Um... <laughs> I want, I want to see, what's it called? Mackinac Island? One of these Mackinac things. Island, yeah. yeah. I, I got to go there. You so, know, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting place to visit. You should know. <laughs> I'd like to. So anyway, that's the substantive part of our um, webinar for today. But I want to point out a couple of things that are part of the real property section. And I really encourage people not just to join the real property section, but we have a lot of ways that you can participate. And it's good for your own knowledge to learn and career and make connections. Um, but we have a new um, continuing legal education package that people can take advantage of um, until September, which is you can get a bundle of continuing education classes. There's, there's from the website, you can choose what you want. And there's a package that will give you all three MCLE requirements for only $149.99. And if you just have to be a CLA member, if you're not a, a California Lawyer Association member, it's a lot more expensive, like $1,100. But for $150, at least you'll get your MCLE and you can choose real property, substantive related topics. Um, I think that will that'll help your practice a lot. And if someone is an expert in cannabis or um, pool law or anything like that, and you'd like to put on a webinar or help put on a webinar, uh, please contact Marty Triano. He's our education chair of the real property law section. And, you know, some people have great ideas for a webinar, but if say you don't know how to do Zoom, I'm, I didn't know how to do Zoom until a couple of years ago. I didn't even know what Zoom was until the middle of 2020, but um, you know, we can help you, um, you know, put on a, a, what, any topic you want. If you have an article you'd like to write, sometimes you had a very interesting case and you have some briefs that you were successful with and you learned some nuances of law. I have my Legal Secrets blog, it has a lot of little cute things in there. Um, but you might want to write a little short article and we have an email, um, not blast, an email newsletter that we can send out and it's, it's really good for getting business. You can send it to clients and it's fun to write. And so I have the information here. If you're interested in writing either an article for the, the email or for the real property journal, um, I've edited a lot of articles for the Real Property Journal. I've had an article published on the Real Property Journal. I like that. It's kind of fun. Um, it takes a lot of time, but it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. And if anybody's in the San Diego area, tonight is the hot August nights at the Loma Club. Um, it's on the CLA website. You can find the link. I'm pretty sure that you can click and sign up. Um, that's a good networking event. It's not just for lawyers. There's real estate brokers and other people there and food and fun. Coming up next month is the California Lawyer Association annual meeting. Um, they have, if it's not too late to sign up, there's classes um, and, you know, networking events. Everybody can participate. And then I have under the save the date, we have the real property law section retreat. Um, which is next March, this time this time or next year is going to be Rancho Mirage. So that's in Southern California. So you guys can thaw out from the Northern California semi-cold winters. And that sounds like a lot of fun. And we have also specific things called practice areas. 
it could be brokers, financing, litigation, HOA law, anything you want. Um, I have some of the contact information here at the bottom of the, the page. And we're going to have a new um, leader of our real property law section starting in September, Franz Ferro. Um, so we're going to have a lot of fun and interesting things coming up um, there. And I appreciate everybody joining with us today. I hope it was uh, fun and maybe useful. Uh, thank you, Pam, for explaining what California Pathways is and how it helps you know the kids yeah. in our state. I appreciate that. My pleasure. All right. Well, that's going to end it, um, our session for today. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions for me or for Pam, um, give us a, an email. It's probably easier or call, whatever you guys want to do. But thank you very much. Have a great week. Great day. Thank you.